All right, so in this lab, we're gonna take a look at a titration. And so if you think back to Gen Chem, uh, what does a titration tell us, uh, tell us? Well, titrations tell us how much blank is in my blank, right? So you can have all kinds of different types of titrations that tell you how much of something you have in something else. In this case, we're gonna be doing an acid-base titration or multiple acid-base titrations. And so we're gonna know how much acid or how much base is in our solution. And so remember acids are H pluses, and then we're talking about water here, so bases are hydroxides. So before we even get to the actual titrations, first thing we're gonna do is standardize. So we're gonna do a standardization of sodium hydroxide in this case. And what a standardization is, is basically just finding the concentration of something. So remember these two brackets mean concentration, um, accurately slash precisely, right? So we're gonna learn what is our exact concentration. Um, and so let's take a look at an example here. So in this case, we're gonna have a solution of some six molar sodium hydroxide that we're gonna further dilute, right? And so the bottle says it's six molar, does that really mean that it's six molar? Not really. Um, over time, maybe at one point it is six molar, but over time it's going to change, right? It's gonna go from being six molar hydroxide to some unknown concentration of hydroxide. And so why does this happen? There's two kind of main reasons in this case. Uh, one case, and this is more so for solids, ours will already be a solution, so this won't be that big of a deal, but if you have some solid, um, sodium hydroxide, as well as some other compounds, they're constantly absorbing water. And so this is called hygroscopic. And so what that means is that they're pulling water out of the air, and so their weight is changing, and so they're cons or, you know, the amount of sodium hydroxide is not actually consistent. Uh, you weigh out one gram, but that whole gram isn't sodium hydroxide. Some of it is sodium hydroxide, some of it is water. Um, in our solution, that won't really matter too much. But another thing that these solutions do is the sodium hydroxide can interact with carbon dioxide in the air to form uh, bicarbonate, which can then actually precipitate out as a solid or stay in solution. But either way, you can see that you're changing the concentration of our sodium hydroxide. And so the first thing we're gonna do in this lab is find out what is our actual concentration of sodium hydroxide. So the way we're going to find out um, our concentration of sodium hydroxide and then later on the concentration of some unknown compounds is through a titration. So think back to Gen Chem. In the titrations, you have this thing up here that is a burette. And so in this thing, we can measure the volume uh, very exactly or very precisely. So we're going to put our sodium hydroxide up here. And for the first standardization step, we're going to have a little beaker down here with a known amount of KHP. So I colored it yellow here, but it's, it's, it's clear in real life, right? So a known concentration of KHP or a known amount. And we use KHP because it's very stable. It's not very hygroscopic and so it won't absorb water. And so we can, by weighing it out, the solid and then dissolving some water, we can know exactly how much is in there. So it's often used as the standard. KHP stands for potassium, hydrogen, phthalate. So even though it starts with a P, the P is silent because, uh, you know, English language, uh, go blame an English major for that, not me, right? So we're going to use this compound as our standard um, to find the concentration of our sodium hydroxide. And so KHP, now that we're studying organic chemistry, we can take a look at the structure of some of these organic compounds. So I'll go ahead and draw you uh, the skeletal structure for KHP. We have this negatively charged acetate component. And then on this other side, we have this kind of carboxylic acid component. And so we can add some sodium hydroxide to it. Notice that I haven't drawn the potassium in the KHP nor the sodium in the sodium hydroxide. They're just spectator ions. There's no point to draw them. And we can actually draw the mechanism of reaction. So this is our acidic proton right here. Um, so if you haven't touched on this yet, don't worry about it. You'll get to it eventually, um, but it'll be a good foreshadowing. 
So the electrons in the sodium hydroxide are going to pick up this H, and then the electrons in this OH bond are going to go on this oxygen. To form our final products here. So you can see we're deprotonating the KHP. And then once we use up all the KHP, our base can then interact with our indicator. And so, right, what we're going to be doing here is adding some sodium hydroxide into the solution and titrating this. How do we know the endpoint? How do we know when to stop? Well, we've put an indicator in here. And so, right, we're titrating away. Once this solution turns pink, that tells us to stop. Pink here is going to indicate that the solution has become basic. So you've deprotonated all of your KHP, and thus you need to stop. And then you can use stoichiometry to go from the amount of KHP that you weighed out to the concentration of sodium hydroxide, because the concentration is going to be moles over liters, right? You can use stoichiometry to figure out how many moles of sodium hydroxide you added, and then you can use the readings on the burette to find out how many liters of sodium hydroxide you added. And so uh, in Gen Chem, you guys also probably use these indicators, but you had no idea what they were or how they function. So now we've got a little bit more knowledge. So let's take a look at this indicator and how and why it turns pink when it becomes basic. So again, the pink color comes from our indicator. And in this case, our indicator is phenolphthalein. Again, with a funky spelling, not my fault. Um, and so we can take a look at the structure of this component. It has this arene group over here, this oxygen base group over here, and then two phenol groups up here. So maybe you saw this structure um, in Gen Chem and you had no idea what the heck it means, and now we know a little bit more about it. And so this is going to interact with our sodium hydroxide. Uh, so we'll just put hydroxide minus here. And this solution over here, this compound right here is colorless or clear, right? And so we can draw a mechanism. I'm going to break a little bit of a rule. Technically, you shouldn't have this many arrows in one mechanism. I could draw some better resonance structures that would let us do this in, in less arrows. But uh, for now, it's, it's good enough. So the hydroxide is going to pick up this H these electrons in this bond are going to kick over to uh, this other bond right here. This double bond is going to move over here. This double bond is going to move over here. And then we're going to break this carbon-oxygen bond to get our final product here. Right, and so we got this final product. You see now the negative charge has moved all the way over to this oxygen. And this compound here is pink. So you can take a look at the two structures and we can see that kind of how it turns pink because we have a change in structure. And the structure and properties of compounds are very interrelated. So when you change the structure, you change um, the properties. In this case, it's gonna go to pink. Now, why does it go from clear to pink? Uh, we don't know quite enough information yet to answer that question. We'll get more of this on the conjugation and the UV vis chapter. Uh, so once we get on that, we'll learn why this one on the left is clear and the one on the right is pink. And so overall, remember our order here. First, we're going to use First, we're going to standardize this sodium hydroxide using the KHP, and then we're going to stand, use this standardized concentration of sodium hydroxide to find some concentrations of some unknowns. In this case, it's going to be some solutions of HCl. So we'll do some solutions of HCl this time, and then in the next lab, we'll take a look at some vinegar. All right, so the last thing we want to talk about here is that we want to micro scale everything. So the procedure that you'll read 
uh, is for a much larger scale, something maybe you'd use in Chem 101. Uh, but with organic chemistry, we're going to be working on the micro scale. So here's some practice to, to work with small amounts of stuff. So for example, um, your burette in general chemistry would be about 50 milliliters, right? You could hold about 50 mils of liquid. We're going to shrink that down to two mLs, right? Two mLs. Um, so you can see that's quite a bit of a difference. And so we'll be using these tiny burettes. Here's a picture of one of them filled with liquid, right? And so we want to be able to do, or we want to be able to read this correctly. So remember, uh, liquids, you always read the volume from the bottom of the meniscus. So for example, in this one right here, we're not, we're not going to read up here. We're going to read kind of down here, right? Down there. Um, so always read from the bottom of the meniscus. And then the second point is keep track of your sig figs or know how many sig figs you can use here, right? So, um, and read this correctly, right? So we have 0.8 mLs and then 0.9 mLs, right? And we're going downward so we can see it's between 0.8 and 0.9. So that would be 0 0.8 something, right? This zero needs to be here because this is a zero. 0.8, right? So 0 0.8 is the first component. And then if we kind of zoom in here, we can see that this one is one, this one is two, three, four, five, and then somewhere around here is six, right? So it's somewhere between five and six. So it's going to be 0 0.85. Five. Um, and then this last one, it is a bit subjective depending on how you read it. So you want to read the bottom of the meniscus and try to go over there. I'm actually going to go 0.86. And then remember, you're allowed to guesstimate one more number. And so it looks to me like it's right on 0.86. So it's 0 0.860. So uh, these burettes are accurate or have sig figs to the thousandths place. Right, so make sure you are reading your burette correctly. And then finally, with titrations, remember our endpoint here should be a light pink. Not a heavy pink, but a very light pink. Um, and so let me just show you some examples of this. So on the left is what you'll start off with, right? It's going to be a clear solution. So this is clearly not done, right? And then we can titrate. We can add some more sodium hydroxide. And then eventually we'll get a light pink. And this light pink should stay here for at least 30 seconds, right? So this one here is kind of just right. You could maybe get it a little bit lighter, um, but that's about the color that you want to see. And then if we continue on adding even more sodium hydroxide, if you get this darker pink or maybe even darker than this, um, you've overshot it. Um, and so one thing you'll notice in the video is that this is actually quite difficult to do uh, due to our kind of you know, homemade burette. It's very hard to dispense small amounts of liquids. And so this is something that would take uh, a decent bit of practice. I've only really done this lab once. Um, and so you can see, unfortunately, most of my results will actually overshoot. Um, and that's okay. In real life, we don't do experiments just one. We would once we would do this experience mul experiment multiple times or any experiment multiple times. There's always unique challenges when doing any experiment, and you always need to need some kind of practice. Uh, because this is a kind of more educational experience, we don't really have time to do these labs multiple times. So we're just going to kind of uh, you know do our best the first time, but understand we're not going to be perfect. And so the kind of end result here is that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, it's going to happen, and it's a good thing that it happens because from every mistake you make, you can learn something about it, and that's really what this whole course um, and this whole lab experience is about. And one of the main ways we learn about these experiments um, and not to repeat them again is to write them down in our lab manual, right? So must write in lab manual. If you weigh overshoot something, uh, that's okay, it happens, but you wanna make sure that you make note of it so that you know that this number 
might not be as accurate um, as a reader might interpret it to be. So just make sure to take good notes. Again, a big reason that you're taking notes isn't for you, but it's for the scientists coming after you. All right, so the first thing we need to do is take our six molar hydroxide and dilute it to 0.7 molar hydroxide. So we've gone ahead and done the calculations and we determined that we need about 12 to 13, I would say 12 milliliters of the six molar sodium hydroxide, which I've transferred into this smaller container. So let's go ahead and get 12 moles of this or 12 milliliters of this. All right, so reading by the bottom of the meniscus, we have 10 milliliters right there, and we're going to transfer this um, into our volumetric flask. So this volumetric flask is meant to dispense 100 milliliters of liquid, and that's when you fill it up to this line right here. So we'll put our 12 mils of sodium hydroxide here and then dilute the rest with water. Transfer our 10 mils. and then measure out another two mils to make 12. All right, so reading our graduated cylinder, I overshot it a little bit. And we have about 2.05 milliliters. So 2.05 milliliters plus the 10 from before. Pour that in here. And now we'll just dilute with distilled water up until we reach this mark right here. So we'll have 100 mils of solution.
Now you want to get down low and go to eye level and add enough water until the bottom of your meniscus reaches that marker. Perfect. As you can see, that took a little bit of while. Really what I should have done is poured some water out into a beaker, filled it up, and then just use um, this for the last little bit. So the camera angle makes it look like I went over, but if you look at it from the proper angle, you can see that our bottom of our meniscus just reaches that line. Next thing we can do is just shake this up a little bit. So hold this cap and then just invert and revert a few times. You can see it's all mixing up. And now we can just go ahead and transfer into our container for future use. and we have diluted our sodium hydroxide to approximately 0.7 molar. All right, so next up, we're gonna construct our micro burette. So first off, we have our burette right here. So go ahead and open up the packaging. And then to the top of the burette, we're going to attach a piece of rubber hosing. going to be a tight fit so you're going to have to kind of squeeze it in there cool then to your piece of rubber hosing we are going to add a syringe so you're going to want to shove this in here and then just rotate it it's important that this gets in there nice and tight So it feels nice and tight. And then to the other end, we are going to add a pipette tip. And next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna melt this plastic a bit to really seal this pipette tip. So back here, we've got a heat gun. Um, it's essentially just a hair dryer on steroids. So we'll turn this up to high, give it a second to heat up. And then you're gonna to wanna to heat this area where the glass meets the plastic. So just heat it up a little bit, and then if you can, press it further in and make a nice, tight seal. That should be on there tight enough. And now we have our burette set up. All right, so next up, we're gonna test our burette and make sure everything is nice and sealed. So in this little beaker, I transferred some distilled water. We're simply gonna pick it up and then make sure it doesn't come out. So to pick things up, you're gonna put this end of the burette into the water, and then you're gonna suck up by pulling up on here. Let's go a little further back. Simply stick this into the water and push up on your syringe. Go a little bit above the zero mark and then hold your syringe vertical and see if any liquid comes out. And so you can see 
Uh, we have nothing coming out, and so I'm going to push down on here, and you guys will see the liquid start coming out. You see those drops? It's pretty tough to have it come out one drop by one drop. All right, you can see I'm squeezing lightly, but there's still a whole lot of drops coming out. And so when we reach our end of our end or close to our end point, it's going to be easy to overshoot. So what we're going to do instead is you're going to hold this part of the burette and you're simply just going to tap here uh, to get these drops to come out slower and one by one. It's going to be difficult to do when this isn't attached, so we'll practice that in a bit. So I'll go ahead, shoot out all of this water. Pick up some more water just to rinse it out. and then re-dispense this water. All right, next up, we'll condition our burette, and then we're ready to titrate. All right, next up, we have to condition our burette, so we wanna make sure that all the liquid in here is our sodium hydroxide and not water or something else. So I have our 0.7 molar sodium hydroxide that we made earlier. I'm just going to pour a small amount into a beaker. I'll take our burette, pull up here to pull up some sodium hydroxide. Go a bit above the zero mark. You can see nothing's coming out, and then dispense it into a waste container. Repeat this one more time. Dispense it back out. And then refill the burette. This time you want to be careful and try not to get any air bubbles and get it right around zero. You can still have an air bubble up in the top, so I'm just going to toss this back out. Get this close to the zero mark, you can get a little flick. And then you wanna make sure you get rid of the air bubble down in the bottom here. See how there's an air bubble there. So go ahead, just dispense until the air bubble is gone. Cool. And now we're ready to titrate. Right, one last thing we want to do is put a blue piece of tape around here just to indicate that this is a base in here. So blue is base, red will be acid, and we'll use this labeling system later on in the semester. All right, so next up we have to weigh out our potassium hydrogen phthalate that we'll need for one of our standardization trials. So first thing we're gonna do is grab a piece of weight paper, and then we're gonna fold it in half like so. And this will make it easier to pour at the end. Open it up. Put it on our balance. Wait for it to stabilize. And then tear. 
And now we'll want to weigh out approximately 0 0.107 grams of our KHP that I have in this secondary container. And again, it doesn't, you don't have to exactly get 0 0.107. What matters is that you write down how much you use. So we'll use proper weighing technique, uh, KHP in one hand, scupula in the other, open up both sides, and weigh it up, out approximately 0 overshot it a bit but that's okay all we have to do is write down how much we used and then we want to write this number down and then we'll simply transfer our khp into our 10 milliliter beaker Cool. All right, so here we have our 10 mil beaker with our KHP in it. To this, we'll add our stir bar that we made yes or the previous day to do, do the stirring for us. And then we'll just simply dissolve it with some water. How much water you use doesn't really matter because we know how much KHP is in here. But you want to use enough to dissolve all this material while still leaving space for um, the sodium hydroxide you're going to add. And then we'll turn on our stirring. When it's blinking, that means it hasn't caught up to the speed that you've set it to yet. And then when it stays stationary, that means it is rotating at that speed. Cool. And now you just want to give it a little bit so all of your KHP dissolves. Alright, so we've got our KHP down here, our sodium hydroxide up here. We've measured our initial reading. We're going to add one drop of our indicator, phenolphthalein. And then we're going to start titrating. And so we're going to titrate until the pink color stays for about 30 seconds. Let's add one drop of the phenolphthalein. Move our burette over. And then just squeeze the top of the syringe to stop to start titrating. And so you can see a slight pink, pink color, but it's going away quite rapidly. And then we'll go ahead and just zoom in on the beaker so you guys can watch this pink action occurring. So you can see I'm trying to get it to come out one drop at a time, but it's actually very difficult to do. So I'm going to practice my tapping technique. I'm going to hold the syringe and just tap and see if we can get one drop to come out at a time. And you see that's, that's much more controlled. So I'll do this closer to the end point 
And for now, I'll just go back to the kind of brute force. As you can see, the pink color is staying longer and longer, so I'm going to try to go slower and slower. Not like that. So you can see I made a bit of a mistake. I probably overshot it by one drop, um, but we'll see with our next trial and then calculate a standard deviation between the three trials. All right, so time for the second round of titration. Here I'm just going to quickly pour out a good bit of liquid because I know it's not going to reach the end point, right? So I'm just going to very quickly pour out about half a mil. And then when I'm closer now to the end point, I'll go slower. One thing you want to make sure to do is add your drop of phenolphthalein. So that's why it hasn't turned pink at all. Let's see if we overshot our endpoint. No, nope, we didn't overshoot the endpoint, so we're okay. We can keep going.
You can tell we're very close. I'm gonna give a little bit of swirl. If you see some pink in the middle, that's not necessarily it staying. It's just not necessarily getting stirred by the stir bar. And boom. So it looks like we got the end point much closer this round. One thing you may notice over time is that you might get an air bubble in this pipette. If that happens, simply just squeeze the air bubble out by dispensing some uh, sodium hydroxide into a waste container. or just push it down like that, and then make your initial and final reading. All right, so third standardization trial, I'm gonna add my drop of indicator. And then I'm going to go ahead and just immediately dispense about 0.6 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide because I know it won't take more or less than that. And as you can see, I have not indeed overshot my endpoint. Now I'm just going to get there quicker.
and we're done. All right, next up we're gonna titrate some unknown concentration of hydrochloric acid to find out its concentration. So I put it here in the secondary container and we're gonna pick this up using an auto pipette. So you can see this auto pipette right now is set to pick up 0.750 mLs. Um, you can change it by twisting this knob here. See how the numbers change? But we want it at 0.750. Cool. And so the way this works to pick some liquid up, first thing you're going to do is you're going to press it until it gets a little tough to press. Then you're going to dip the pipette tip into the liquid and then you're just going to slowly release. And that's going to pick up the liquid. To dispense the liquid, you're going to want to push down, same amount, and then you want to push a little bit further, right? So there's actually two pushes, right? Here's first push, second push, first push, second push. And the second push is for dispensing only. So we'll go first push, dip it in here, let go and let it pick up the liquid. Check that there are indeed no air bubbles and then dispense. So first push and then to get the last bit out, second push. And that's it. All right, so time to start titrating our unknown HCl. I'm gonna add a drop of our phenolphthalein, our indicator. And then we're gonna start titrating. Since this is an unknown, we wanna go relatively slowly. You could do a fast trial beforehand um, to get an approximate measurement, but we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna start titrating away slowly. You can see we have like no pink color at first. That means that we're far from the end point. And so we can add rapidly. And we're done. All 
All right, so next run with the HCL, I'm gonna add my one drop of phenolphthalein. And then last time it took about 0.8 ml, so I'm gonna pour out about 0.7 mLs uh, rapidly to get close to our end point and that way not waste any time. We're about very, very close. Last trial with HCL, add our indicator. And then again, I'm gonna quickly squirt in about 0.7 mLs because I know that won't go over our endpoint. and then slow down when you get close to the end point. Definitely overshot it a bit, um, but not that terribly.